Thank you very much. And it's always lovely to be at the NEC for either the Spring Fair or the Autumn Fair. I tend to try and do both if I can. I was at Pure in London as well. And as somebody who is a face-to-face -face speaker and traditionally is one of those real weirdos who actually quite likes to be on a stage talking to people and keeping you entertained, hopefully for three quarters of an hour, an hour, um, I've really missed it with COVID. I know we're not supposed to talk about the C word, but um, I have really missed it. So it's always an absolute honour to be back here on um, any stage, but particularly here at the Autumn Fair. So I'm going to be talking about creating and connecting with your tribe. So this is something that I think has particularly come out of COVID as well, where social media isn't just about us being able to sell, but actually being able to connect with our community as well. And it's something that we've noticed as an organization, more and more people wanting us to include that in our training. For us to be able to talk about how important it is to manage a community and to find your community online because they're the people you want to be able to sell to. I'm also a big believer personally that your vibe attracts your tribe and you don't need to sell to everybody, you need to sell to the people who want to buy from you and that's a trap that a lot of us can fall into. So just to give you a little bit of information about we, who we are. So my name's Amy Hobson and I'm with Social Bee and we're an international boutique agency um, who are very proud to be from Norfolk. I'm not, you'll notice a slight brummy twang to my accent. I'm sure I'm from Solihull just down the road, but we are based um, in Norwich in lovely Norfolk and it was a pleasure to be back there on Monday with everybody. But you can see on here obviously some of our accreditation, some of the people that we've worked with. Um, of those, I've worked with Visa with the Great British High, High Street campaign that we were a part of in those dim and distant days way back before COVID, um, but also with Superdry as well. And as you would expect, we're accredited with all the no kinds of businesses that you would expect us to be, like Google and those kinds of things. So this is what we're going to concentrate on today. And this is what we're going to look at. So I'm going to talk about the value of a social media community and how you can build your own, because this isn't something that you can take off somebody else. This isn't something that you can, um, you know, just conjure up from nowhere. You have to build it. But I'm going to talk to you about some of those things. I'm also going to talk about how social media can be a positive place. Very often it has some negative connotations, but it really doesn't need to and it really shouldn't because it can be a positive place. It can be a positive experience for businesses and for your audience so that you can engage with your customers online. And it's that engagement that will keep people coming back to you. And it's that engagement that I will talk about quite a lot in terms of how how that engagement will actually build your audience and will help people to bring others as well. So I'm going to talk to you about a couple of things that you can do with that. And I'm also going to talk to you about how you can use social media and content in particular on social media to start those conversations. Because the clue to social media and success on social media isn't in the content, it's in the social. It's not in the media part of it, it's in the social part of it. And that's something that we can very often forget. As businesses, we go on social media to sell. Yeah, so we're on there to, we've got a message, we've got something we want to sell, we've got a new line in for Christmas, we've got all of these things happening, and we, need, we go on to talk about those things. But that isn't actually very social, and it's the social that will keep people, keep people coming back, and will help you to build a community with them as well. But first of all, I want to look at what is the difference between an audience and a community. And there is a huge difference, particularly in terms of social media. But I want to go back a step before I talk about that. So... Hieroglyphs. Why have we got hieroglyphs on the screen? The reason that they're there is because we have been communicating with written word for a really, really long time. Yeah? So we have made our mark in lots of different ways. Right the way back to hieroglyphs in ancient Egypt. Um, I still remember it vividly from my um, junior school days. Who did ancient Egypt in junior school? Yeah, I think it's a standard across British schools. <laughs> But we've been communicating with that for a really long time. And in, we want to communicate. We want to leave our mark and we want to leave our presence somewhere. Now, it's more likely to be emojis. But they're just the modern hieroglyphs. That's all they really are. Yeah, is it's just a way of us communicating, of us showing our feelings, of us being able to communicate how we feel about something, whether we like it, we hate it, we love it. And love or hate emojis, they are definitely here to stay. Now, if you're an intellectual property lawyer, I'm probably not going to talk to you about emojis, but I'm guessing there's none of those here today. Um, but emojis are simply a way of us communicating in the good old way like we used to with hieroglyphs. But this is where it's very, very different, because this isn't just about us having something that is broadcast. Yeah, This isn't just about me standing here and broadcasting to you as an audience because audience is not a community. They're very different things. So an audience is not about a community where you feel you're involved or you feel you're engaged or you feel that you're part of it. One of the best I, I used to, life before COVID, see a lot of comedians. I was, one of the last comedians I saw live was Joe Lysett. 
And he's, you know, he's a broadcaster, he's a comedian, he stands on stage and he talks to us. But actually, during half time, he asked us, uh, half time? Interval, during the interval, he asked us to um, send him tweets that he could retweet that were slightly inappropriate, a little bit delicate, because I was with my son who was 15 at the time, <laughs> but tell you, he's more worse than mine. Um, but he asked us to be involved in that, and the laughter amongst all of us, because we started to form a community around what each one had done and what each one was saying, and we were working together to try and find the funniest one with the people sat next to us, felt completely different to an audience. We suddenly started to become a part of a community, and that's what you can do with social media. So what is an audience? Let's define what an audience is first. Primarily broadcast, yeah? So this is you simply broadcasting your message and letting people know. It's one to many, yeah? So it's one person stood in front of a big group and broadcasting that message out there. Very passive engagement, yeah? So that engagement isn't active. It tends to be uh, because some, something has prompted you rather than of your own free will. Mainly listeners, but maybe only listeners, because you don't actually know if anybody's listening. Yeah, right now you could all be planning your food shop, you could be all kinds of doing things and not actually listening to me because I don't know that you are. And you're very separate to each other, so there's no community between you. And the primary role of an organisation or a business with an audience is a contributor. So I'm going to create content that will hopefully engage you or hopefully get you to engage with me at least. There's no guarantee of that though. So what's the difference in a community? And it's pretty much the opposite of all of these things. Not a great surprise. It's primarily about conversation. So when you've got a community, it's not about broadcast, it's about a conversation that we have with each other. It's many to many. So it's not just me talking, it's the audience talking. It's the community being brought together. It's active engagement. So you're coming up with things without me prompting you. Yeah, that's all part of what that community is. It's about a collection of contributors. So it's not just what I say, but what all you say about it as well. Think user-generated content here. One of the most powerful forms of marketing you can get is that user-generated content. How many times and how many people here have bought something because somebody's told them how great it is? I know I have, yeah? And it's where you share a common understanding or an interest. You have a passion or you have something in common that brings you together. And that might not necessarily be what you do, but you can tap into that if it's part of that community. And your primary role as the business or as the organization is as a facilitator. So I'm going to facilitate those conversations rather than just broadcast it to you. I'm there to manage what it is that you create and how you talk to me. But how do you build that community? Because it's that community that's really, really valuable to you on social media. So you can have 10,000 followers on social media. Fantastic. Well done. You're doing great. But... If nobody interacts with you, nobody watches a video, nobody likes anything, nobody clicks through, th clicks through and buys or comments, are that audience worth anything to you at all? They're not worth anything to you. They are simply an audience. I'd rather have a community of 1,000 than an audience of 50,000 because that community are the people who will keep your business sustained. They will keep coming back to you. So how do you build that? How do you get yourself to that position? One of the things that you always want to think about is that you're not just building a community, but you're hopefully building a campaigning community. Because that campaigning community is what will sustain your business and will keep bringing people back to you. So you start with a broadcast audience. So similar to today. You're on stage, I'm talking, most people are looking at me, not paying attention to one another necessarily. Then there's an engaged audience. So if I was to ask a question and people answered me, I've got an engaged audience. A little bit more value, I get to learn a little bit more about you, but I'm still not any great value. An engaged community is when you start talking to one another. So you start recommending certain things, certain products, you start talking about how great things are, you start sharing that common interest between them. But this is what we really want. This is our engaged campaigning community. So not only are they talking to one another, but they're talking to more people as well. So not only are they in a circle looking at one another, enjoying each other's company and enjoying that time together, whether that's in a Facebook group, whether that's on an Instagram following, whether that's commenting, whatever that is, but they're also bringing other people in. So they're letting other people know about what it is that you do and encouraging them to come along with you as well. Because that's where it starts to come together. That's where it starts to really be important. So let's have a think about, first of all, your audience. Because one of the things with 
social media, and it's something that I come across quite a lot. So if I'm working with a customer, we're working with customers, we're always very keen on knowing who their audience. And sometimes that definition can be a little bit gray because they don't really know it themselves. But this is absolutely vital, particularly with online marketing. Whether you're um, running PPC campaigns, so pay-per-click campaigns, whether you're running Facebook advertising, whether you're just creating content, whether you're creating a new page, you might be at the start of your business journey and you're doing that, whether you're thinking about what it is that you want to buy next for your audience. This is absolutely vital, is having an understanding of who your audience is. Because if you don't know who they are, how can you buy for them? How can you sell to them? How can you create content that they're going to engage with if you don't know who they are? And you can start it fairly simply. You know, so what kind of interests do they have? Are they mainly parents? Are they gift buyers? Are they a sports enthusiasts, if that fits your model? So what is it that they do? What is it that they are? Who are they? And build that picture and always have that picture in mind when you're creating content, when you're talking to people, when you're trying to build that community, this is who you want the community for. Now, one of the things, one of the exercises that I think is really useful with this is to think about, if I, if I asked you, who is your favorite customer? These are the ones who are a pleasure to deal with. If you've got bricks and mortar, when they come in, they come in with a smile on their face and they're really fun to have in the store. You know them, you learn about them, they buy from you all the time. They bring their friends if you run an open night. Those are the ones, if you could, triplicate, duplicate, millionate those, that's what you're after. So think about that person who really lights your soul. They are the people and the reasons why you do the business that you do, because they're the customers that you're looking for. Start with those as your main customer. Now, one of the things, as I said at the start, one of the things that we very often get wrong as businesses is we try and sell to everybody. And I have this conversation quite a lot with big and small businesses. Who can you sell to or who do you sell to? Well, I can sell to everyone. Everyone can buy a gift. Everyone can buy a card. Everyone can buy home accessories. Well, they could, but realistically, even McDonald's don't sell to everybody. Even Pepsi or Coke don't sell to everybody. I drink Coca-Cola, love Coca-Cola. Give me a Pepsi, I'd rather not drink anything at all. Die of dehydration than drink a can of Pepsi. So even Pepsi can't sell to everybody. So you have to define your audience. This is also absolutely critical when it comes to things like pay-per-click advertising, which can be incredibly expensive if you've got a leaky bucket because you don't know who your audience is. So you're getting people, but they're not buying from you because they're not connecting because they're not really your audience. So think about all of those demographics, age, gender. Does it matter where they live? If you've bricks and mortar, does that matter? Is it your online audience? What is it that spurs them on? What is it that they get excited about? And this is a little bit of homework for you. So um, if you want a copy of the slides, I have got to run straight from here because I'm literally speaking the same thing again over on the catwalk. But two of the lovely ladies sat in the audience, Molly and Evie, are with Social Bee. Um, so they've come over to see what the Autumn Fair and Spring Fair is all about. I've been talking about it for a long time. Um, but if you want a copy of the slides and you want to be able to do this, or take a screenshot, take a photo of the, pho a photo of the screen or whatever, give your cards to Molly and Evie. They'll make sure that you get a copy of the slides. Um, I will be hightailing it right across the other side. I've even got both and stocks in my bag because I don't know if I can run in heels anymore. Um, but this is a really useful exercise. So work through. Give them a name. Giving them a name really helps. Super Sue, Amazing Alex, Brilliant Bobby, whatever you want to call them, but give them a name because they are the people that you're always going to be thinking about when you create this content. Think about how old they are. Give them an age range. What do they do? What motivates them outside of what you sell? So what are their common interests? So then looking at the individual platforms and some of this, so we're going to look at some examples of things that I've come across and that I think um, organizations and brands that I think do this really well. So just to give you a bit of a background on Facebook, I'm sure you know Facebook, I'm sure you're familiar with Facebook, but 2.93 billion global daily active users in July 2022 and 500 million Facebook stories are accessed daily. Now, the thing is with social media is that we spend a lot of time on social media. So um, in the UK, um, we spend just under two hours a day on average, about an hour and 46 minutes, I think it was this year that we found the when, we, when the stats were revealed. So just under two hours a day, we don't spend that all in one go. Yeah, we spend that in little bits and pieces. We might have a quick look in the morning when we wake up, when we're dropping the kids off, when we're sat waiting for a meeting. Um, you know, just five minutes because we need to walk away from an email or a problem that we've got. So we look at it in different bits during the day. We're also really guilty of second or third screens. I'll be honest, I was sat last night, TV on, laptop on my knee and my phone next to me. <laughs> Yeah, that's me. I'm guilty of that one. But we access it in little tidbits during the day, but we do access it all the time. A friend of mine recently had um, 
did a challenge with her family that she thought she would find really easy. No social media for the weekend, no phones for the weekend. She even went that far because she was worried about how much screen time her kids were having. I spoke to her on the Monday and I said to her, how was it? And she went, oh my God, it was awful. By Friday night, I was sneaking the phone into the bedroom because I was so used to having my phone. I didn't realize I was as bad as the kids were because we do it subconsciously and we are darting in and, it, and, darting in and out of it all day. On average, users access Facebook eight times a day. So those little tiny bite-sized pieces that we go in for. And seven million businesses use Facebook advertising. Now, there is an argument with Facebook that they've changed the algorithms. The only way you can do it is with advertising, so we don't have a choice. However, if all of those businesses didn't get a return and they didn't find it useful or they weren't able to connect with their audience, they wouldn't keep doing it. So it's actually in the social media platform's vested interest for you to do and for it to work for you. So always bear that in mind with advertising. And one of the questions that I get asked a lot about Facebook is do we have a page or do we have a group or do we have both? Yeah. Now this to some degree does depend on your audience and whether your audience are on Facebook, they might not be. This might not be your, uh, the place for you to be. Um, but this is an example of a business called Between Green. So Jodie is somebody that I met, she's um, from up north, Jodie is somebody that I met through networking, I do a lot of networking both locally and um, nationally as well, and um, Jodie runs both a page and a group really successfully. So a page is where she is more broadcast and her group is where she's more community based. So this is, she runs a, a monthly uh, a box, so she does like an eco-friendly box where you can try new eco-friendly products and try them out um, on a subscription service and that in her group is where she has all of her hints and tips, it's where she drives traffic because she knows that she gets more conversation from there. The thing is particularly with the community is to bear in mind that Facebook favours groups over pages. So if I like a page, it's the equivalent to walking down a high street, seeing a nice shop window, looking in and going, oh I really like that in the window, but then just walking on hasn't got a huge amount of value to it. I'm simply indicating that I might like to buy in the future. If I'm a member of a group, it's the equivalent to walking into the shop, asking what they've got, having a browse, walking out and taking stuff with me and telling everybody how much I like what it is that they do in that shop. So a group has a much higher value in terms of content on Facebook. So it's worth thinking about that if you are thinking about a group. You are more likely to appear in somebody's feed through group activity than you are through a page. But obviously they all require time or require you know content and you know conversation happening use your insights on facebook to really understand who your audience are has anybody looked at their insights on facebook recently do you look at it regularly <laughs> um the thing is with Facebook Insights is Facebook actually of the platforms give you probably more information than anybody else does. It's anonymized so you don't know the names of the people necessarily of everybody who follows you. But what you do know is whether they're male or female, whereabouts they live, what their age is. Um, so you get, actually get to learn quite a lot of information about them compared to something like Twitter where they don't even know whether we're male or female or when our birthday is for the majority of us. That's a huge difference. But with Facebook and Facebook Insights, it allows you to build a better picture of who your audience is. Now, bear in mind as well that your audience on Facebook may be different to your audience elsewhere. So the audience on Facebook may be different to Instagram, to Pinterest, to TikTok, to wherever you are. Um, and this will help you to identify, hopefully, some of that. Uh, because your audience, and sometimes people, even big businesses, when they look at this, get a surprise as to who it is that's actually following them, even in terms of area that they may have more people out of area than they realized. Now, Facebook has two different things on the go at the moment. So this one is in beta. It's been, it's well, it was in beta. It's now being rolled out. So you may have access to Facebook Insights through the professional dashboard, or you may have that one. Yeah, so it may have switched for you. Um, you log in and it says you've got this great new page experience and it's awful. But unfortunately, it's all rented space, so Facebook changes it. Facebook changes it. We don't get a choice, I'm afraid. Um, but that's why you've got those two on there. So it may be in Insights for you, or it may be in the Insights through the professional dashboard. Um, now, one of the things that's worth checking, particularly because at the moment, in the old Insights, you can see when your audience are more likely to be online. It gives you that information. Unfortunately, in the new one, it doesn't. So if you have got the old one, make sure you have a look for that information. It's under Posts, but make sure you have a look for that information now before it's gone. Um, whether or not they're going to reintroduce it, who knows, they're a complete law unto themselves as we know. As I said, it's completely rented space, so what they say goes. Um, but you may find that when you go in now, it diverts you to a professional dashboard. I'm admin on 
many, many pages on Facebook, as I'm sure you can imagine. And I'm about 50-50 at the moment between this one and the, old, and the new one. Uh, sorry, the new one and the old one. Some will also let me switch back, but some won't. So this one is definitely coming, and we're fairly certain that this will stay, so just bear that in mind. With the insights, though, you can not only see your audience, but you can see your posts. So you can see which was your, your most popular post ever, which one got you the most engagement. How can you create that kind of feeling? How can you create that? Because if they're engaging with you, they're part of your community. Yeah, you want that engagement. Engagement feeds the algorithm across all of the different platforms, so it's always worth thinking about that. And this is where you can find your audience information. So um, mix of male and female, what age ranges they fall into, and then you can see from um, what towns and cities, etc. As you can see, this one's Norwich, because this was taken from Social B, who are sort of based in Norfolk. Moving on to Instagram. Any questions about Facebook before I move on? I will leave time at the end for questions, but if anyone's got any questions about Facebook, I'm happy to take those now. No? Okay. So, looking at Instagram, obviously part of Facebook, so owned by Facebook, very, very closely linked, but also different. You may have a different audience on Instagram than you do on Facebook, so remember that. Obviously much slower, uh, much slower, much smaller. 1.21 billion active users in July 2022, more than 500 million daily users, and about that figure again who look at stories on Instagram, so we know that stories are big on there. Instagram has, was kind of built on the perfect picture if you like, it's that perfect moment, the perfect picture, the perfect time, um, and that perfect shot for it. It's also, though, about showing the real business as well. It's not just about that picture perfect. It's very much no filters nowadays as well. So filter, the most popular filter is no filter at all, um, whereas Instagram, if you remember the days when it first started, was very much about the filters. That has moved, um, moved and shifted quite a lot now. It is much more no filter. But you can show people more of a personal touch with Instagram. Instagram can very much be a day in the life of this is who we really are, this is the unboxing, all those kinds of things as well. It doesn't just have to be that pitch perfect moment. One of the um, small clients that I network with and that I've, I've worked with on and off um, for a long time now, one of their most popular um, stories was one where it was outtakes of her trying to show one of the products that they sell. Um, when she accidentally knocked over the glass of wine, it went everywhere. She said a rude word and it went... It was much more popular than the, others, than the others were. But it's because it shows that personal touch makes you look a little bit more human. Obviously, there is a difference between mobile and desktop as well. It is mobile first, very much so. It was an app before it was anything else. Um, so um, you've got, obviously, the difference in those and how it looks slightly. So you've got the um, desktop on the left and um, app on the right, so you get a slightly different feel to it. More functionality is coming into the desktop version, so you can now create posts. You've got things like Creator Studio and Meta Business Suite that you can post through. But I'll be honest, I think the app is really where you need to go with Instagram. Um, you can use other tools for it, but it is very app-based. They favor things that are created within the app as well. So making sure that you, you have that is part of that. And Instagram, we know, um, and if you, I don't know, oh, I'm molting. Um, I don't know how many people um, here know what's happening with Instagram at the moment, other than lots of stuff. <laughs> lots of things have changed. So Instagram, uh, before I go on to what's on the slide, Instagram have made lots of changes recently that have been pushed back on by people who are using Instagram by the creators. So Instagram created a new feed that was very TikTok-like. They ro rolled it out gradually, rolled it out a little bit more, and everyone on Instagram went, no, don't want it. If we want to be on TikTok, we'll be on TikTok. Push back, and it disappeared. Really unusual in social media for them to do that. Um, it's the first time I know of any massive change like that where they've retracted it. And, you know, video from the CEO of Instagram to say, we got it wrong, we're really sorry. What people all also pushed back on, though, was the whole thing around video. So Instagram made it very clear that video is the most popular thing on their platform. We watch more video on Instagram than we do anything else. We spend more time on it. So therefore, you need to create more video. Lots of creators pushed back and said, we don't want to be video creators. We're here for the posts. We're here for different reasons. We don't want, if we wanted to create videos, we'd be on TikTok. We don't want to. And Instagram pushed back and said, sorry, it's staying. We're not retracting this one. It's staying. Now, there is an argument, obviously, that the more video you see, the more video you watch. So it gives an indicator that we're seeing more video, so we're watching more video, but that's because we're seeing it more in the first place. So there is that argument, but Instagram are fairly adamant, which unfortunately brings us to stories and reels, particularly reels where we know that they're investing, they have their own separate tab, they have their own separate discovery. Um, so we know that Instagram are very much focused on reels. 
Stories as well, though, are still hugely popular. And one of the things that I love about stories is that they appear at the top of your feed. Now, I use Instagram both personally and for business. And there are very few platforms where you can say, I can be at the top of a follower's feed. That's what stories gives you and it allows you to do that. And, you know, as a user, I'll start watching stories and then I'll go down that little rabbit hole. <laughs> and then I end up looking at ones that I've no idea I even followed their account five minutes later. Because that's what they do to us. They're very easy to watch. They're very immersive. Very easy to get engagement on. Lots of different tools, lots of different things that they give us. As they are also increasing on reels as well. So we are seeing more and more to toys, um, toys, more and more options on reels. But 33% of the most viewed stories are from businesses. Now, I think partly the reason for that is that on Instagram, we actually engage with businesses more than we do on something like Facebook. Facebook is a very personal space. Instagram, we're a little bit more, a little bit happier. I, for one, I know on Instagram, I follow quite a few brands. I'm only connected to a handful of people. Uh, real life people rather than brands. It's mainly brands that I follow on there. And over 500 million people watch or use stories every day. That's two out of five users. Yes, that's an awful lot of people who are using stories on a daily basis. And there are some people who I follow who I go onto Instagram every day because if I don't, I feel like I'm going to miss out from one of their stories. I know it's quite sad, but it is. That's what it is. It, it builds in that kind of fear of missing out because they disappear. And whilst you can save stories to highlights, it's very rare that you'd save everything. So you get to really experience that. Reels, however, receive 22% 20, more engagement than regular Instagram video posts. So that's, again, another reason why they're favoring Reels, because they know that they increase engagement, and engagement is what feeds the algorithm. We know that to be the case. And Instagram Reels beat all of the short-form video apps when it comes to engagement. They have a global average of 53 minutes of viewing time per session. So with Reels, we keep watching them. We just keep going. Yeah, we really like them. We, we like to be that. However, and this is something that I come across a lot, so a lot of the small businesses in particular that I network with will say to me, Amy, I don't want to do reels. I don't want to stand in front of the screen and do this and point and make silly faces and have to do a silly dance. That isn't what reels is about anymore. Reels doesn't have to be you in front of the camera doing a funny dance. Now, don't get me wrong, reels with a human create more engagement, absolutely. So you in front of there and you being part of that, absolutely. But you can do it as part of a mini setup. You can do it as an unboxing. You can do it as a new stock reveal. It doesn't have to be you doing a silly dance anymore. They have definitely matured from that point of view. But I would urge you to experiment with them and to do more with them. And again, on Instagram, use your insights. So make sure that you are looking at your insights to understand who your audience are. Now, on Instagram, you can still see when your audience is more likely to be online. So if you go into your followers, and scroll down to the bottom, it'll tell you who, when your audience is more likely to be online, and you can switch it between days of the week as well, so you can see if there's a, a pattern there with days of the week. What I can almost guarantee you is that they're probably online when you don't want to be online. <laughs> Yeah, so when, you, when, you, when they hit the evening and you hit your evening, they're much more likely to be online then. So looking at Pinterest. Pinterest is obviously much smaller. However, don't discount it. Um, Pinterest is one of my personal favorite um, platforms, both from a business for the right business and from a personal user perspective as well. I get lost in Pinterest. Pinterest is where my life is. I have four boys at home. So uh, Pinterest is where my life is tidy and I have scatter cushions <laughs> that don't just end up on the floor. And when my kids were younger, no Lego anywhere either. Um, but it's all up in the loft now. Um, but 433 million monthly active users. Yeah, but we are highly engaged when we're on Pinterest. We use it as a search engine. So 47% of US Pinterest users log onto the site specifically to shop. Now, Pinterest are very private about the data that they give us and the insights. So they don't actually share a lot of information. What they do share tends to be US-based as well. But what we do know is that it's predominantly female in the Western world. Not necessarily the case in Asia. Asia, it's about 50-50. But definitely in the Western world, it's always hovered around that 80%, 20%. But the male audience is growing. Um, it is getting slightly bigger. As you can see, 40% of new signups on Pinterest are men. My partner included, included and absolutely loves it. Thought it was just for me messing around at night, but it's not, apparently. Um, and 80% of Pinterest users access it via mobile, so very mobile-based. Um, one of the things that I particularly like about Pinterest is they're very good at collating. They're very good at sending you information and saying, 
you've seen things like this, here are some more. They're very good at kind of giving you that digest if you sign up for it, um, and that little gentle reminder that you need to come back in. They're also getting better at lots of other things as well, which I'll talk about in a second. Great for B2C companies, so very much in that B2C realm, both local and large brands, and they are very much browsers who become customers who then become promoters. One of the other things with Pinterest is that the vast majority of searchers are not brand connected. So they're not looking for a specific brand, they're looking for an idea of something. So it's not a Karen Millen summer dress, it's a summer dress. Yeah, they are not brand related. What that means is that you have an enormous opportunity there to be discovered. Whereas if I'm looking for a specific brand, I'm a lot less likely to find you, whether that's a search engine that I use anywhere else. Because the other thing with Pinterest is it is a search engine in its own right. Yeah, so it's where people go to search. And I'll be honest, there are some things that I go to Pinterest for before anything else. I won't go to Google, I will go to Pinterest for recipes, home inspiration. I've recently done a lot of redecorating at home. I have a renovations board where I've pinned all the colors and all the things that I'd like in the house. I didn't go to Google for that information, I went to Pinterest. So if you're a regular pinner, you're more likely to go there as well. Same with fashion and fashion inspiration and those kinds of things. Um, I've got a friend who's got a um, vintage wedding next year and I'm already collecting information and bits and pieces for her um, through vintage searches. So, not surprisingly, when I go into Pinterest, I get a lot of vintage come up in my feed now, which is great. It means that it, it's actually delivered to me when I need it. So, as I said, it isn't just a social media platform. It also works as a search engine. It's about exploration, discovery, inspiration. It's about all of those things. The other thing to think about as well with Pinterest is that we're a very engaged and a more affluent audience potentially. So many years ago, I worked with a business who, uh, who specialized in home accessories. He'd started Pinterest because his wife had told him that he should, had absolutely no faith in it whatsoever. He'd basically done it to keep her quiet. They've now sold the business and got divorced, so that's how long ago it was, but that also explains a little bit about the relationship. But when we looked at his Google Analytics to actually dig into where his audience were coming from, and when I'd asked him, he'd said, Facebook. I get all of my business off Facebook, was his response. When we actually looked at that, we actually found that Pinterest had a much higher average spend, almost three times as much as Facebook. So his audience was still buying, and they were coming from Pinterest, but they were buying higher prices, or they were buying more in one go. Not surprisingly, he started to love Pinterest a little bit more. Yeah, he started to switch some of his content around, so he had some of his higher, higher end items on Pinterest, some of his more budget items on Facebook, both increased, yeah, because he was appealing to both audiences. Yeah, Pinterest still, when I, I haven't had contact with him for a while, but before he sold the business, Pinterest was still one of his biggest earners. Yeah, creating home edits, creating, um, you know, how to style a sofas, those kinds of things and that kind of content that sold his products for him because people looked for inspiration and then bought. Yeah, so it's, it's worth thinking about that in terms of Pinterest as well. If your audience are there, I am not an advocate at all of saying to you, you should be on all of these platforms. You should be on the ones where your audience are. If you want more information about that or more help or want to look, by all means get in touch with me. Um, hang around after the next one that I'm on. I'm more than happy to speak to people if you want to come and find me after I've been on the catwalk um, at... 12.45, I should be finished there. So if you want to come and speak to me then, by all means, please do. Or give you a business card to Evie and um, Molly, and I'll be more than happy to get in touch. Um, just so, you know, if you're not 100% certain or you don't know where to look for the information, I'm more than happy to point you in the right direction for those. One of the other things as well, because it is a search engine, is you can use this to, like, a little bit like using um, Google search to understand what your audience is potentially searching for. Yeah, so not just living room, but living room inspiration, ideas, decor, designs, colors, designs, small spaces, decor, modern. The list is endless in terms of what people are searching for. And Pinterest is, has also very much improved its um, shopping as well. So not only has it changed the way that we search and its guided search, which is improving all the time, but it's also increased and has invested a lot of money in its shopping. So you can upload your catalogs there so people can buy direct through you, um, direct through Pinterest. And one of the things that I really like about it is that if I save you, so if I save one of your products, it then appears in a shopping list board that it creates. So when I'm ready to buy, I can just go to the shopping list and it'll confirm when it's in stock, the price, all those kinds of things. So it makes it easy for me to buy. So it makes it easy for me to browse and to look, then it makes it easy for me to buy from you as well. Um, and this, 
as you can see, this is another company who I um, do a lot of networking with. They are very, and she, I don't think she's here, just checking. No, she sometimes joins us at the auto fair. She's local. Um, but um, reusable don't, are not particularly active on Pinterest at all, but they still get 13,000 monthly views because they've got the shopping catalog on there. Um, if I said to you, I'm going to get you 13,000 views of your Facebook page, you'd be cock-a-hoop. <laughs> yeah, so again, something to think about and something to consider for Pinterest. And you create Pinterest boards. And one of the things when you're building a community on Pinterest is to think about other things that they may want to see. Yeah, so one of, the, um, one of my um, friends um, has a wedding business. Yeah, her boards are not just about what she does. It's wedding dresses, it's styles, it's the new styles, it's colors, it's cakes, it's all of those things. The pin that has driven more traffic through to her website than anything else is a pin that talks about what dress shape you should wear for your body shape. She doesn't sell dresses. Yeah, but that's what people are searching for. They've discovered her through that, and then they've clicked through to her website. If you are connected to weddings any, anyway, I absolutely urge you to get onto Pinterest because 25% of wedding inspiration boards are pinned by people who haven't even been proposed to. Yeah, so we go on there for inspiration a long time before we've even got a ring on our finger. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, but let your personality shine through. Embrace what your audience are interested in as well, whether that's office inspiration, but you don't actually sell, you know, you sell office products, but give them office inspiration. Pin from other people. It's not just about yours. It's about repinning content from everyone else as well. Obviously not your competition. Make sure your account has been switched to business profile. Once you do that, you'll also have access to insights. And those insights will give you your audience insights. So it'll tell you a little bit more about your audience, tell you your best pins. It'll tell you how far those pins have traveled. Um, you can set on all of these, you can set the um, widgets into your website so that you can track that information through. So you get all of that tracking information so you can see who's been where. It also means you can retarget as well. So look at all of the different options available to really get to grips with your audience. Because once you under understand your audience, you'll be able to to talk to them better, you'll be able to connect with them better, you'll be able to build a community. So that's your homework for you, or one of the homeworks. All I want you to do is to look at your insights and analytics. What do they tell you about your audience? Is it what you expect? Are they different to what you expected? So have a look at your insights and analytics. And have a look and see what's your best ever. So what's your highest engagement rate you've ever had? Because that's what you're looking to beat. I'm a little bit competitive, but that's what you're always looking to be, is your best ever engagement rate. How can I recreate that? I can almost guarantee that your best engagement rate will come from a pin or a post or a picture or something that is not related directly to you selling to people. This is not about your buy nows, this is about you building a community. So how do you engage? There are lots of different things that you can do on social media rather than just tell people to buy. And if I was, well, let me put it this way. If you've got a bricks and mortar store and somebody came in and you walked up to them and went, <coughs> excuse me, picked up a random item and went, buy this. I want you to buy it. Why aren't you buying it? I'm sorry, why, didn't, why, why aren't you buying this product? I don't get it. Why aren't you buying it? Yeah, buy now, buy now. Would they engage with you or would they turn around and walk away, get out of that shop at the earliest poss possible opportunity? It's exactly the same online. It's exactly the same with social media. You want to make people feel comfortable. So if somebody comes into your store, you chat with them. How's the weather? How's the market outside? What's happening? Yeah, how are you? I haven't seen you in a couple of months. How are you? How was the wedding you were going to? It's all of those things that are actually your best salesman. And you can be that on social media. But you have to have conversations with people. So user generator content to add authenticity. So other people saying how great you are, not just you. I can stand here all day and tell you how amazing social be are at what we do. But you're much more likely to believe a random stranger who comes on and goes, yeah, we worked with these guys. They were great. Yeah, that's just the way of the world. We believe it. So user generated content to add authenticity. Share articles, blog posts, expertise. It doesn't just have to be your content. You can use other people's. Yeah, if you're local, if you've got a local community, your bricks and mortar, share content from other shops, share content from the activities that are happening close by, from the pub that always has a great firework display. Build all of that. That's all about you being part of the community. Provide useful content that adds value. So when you create content, there's a couple of questions you need to ask yourself. Does it entertain? Does it educate? Does it empower? Because if it does any of those, it's likely to engage, and it's the engagement that we really want. And I'm not talking about clickbait. I'm not talking about the heart for this, sad face for this. You know, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about genuine conversations. 
start discussions and ask questions to encourage interaction. So um, if you start a conversation, be present to answer questions or anything that may come up from there. If somebody came up to you in real life and said, oh, I really love this product, can you tell me more? You wouldn't go and walk away from them. And if you did, you definitely wouldn't expect them to be there three days later when you get around to actually answering them on social media. So you have to be responsive, not just for your audience, but for the algorithms as well. Create surveys or polls to encourage participation. Use some of those tools, you know, the this or that's on Instagram stories. Encourage people to answer which one, you know, what, what's going to be our next reveal. Um, you know, which one's your favorite? Do you prefer this one or that one? All of those things that you can do to encourage interaction. How many times I've sat there on, on social media, on particularly on things like stories where I've answered polls, and I don't even know why I've answered. <laughs> I'm not actually that invested, but I'll answer it anyway if you put a poll in front of me. Share positive reviews and testimonials. So, you know, it's not just you saying how great you are, it's other people as well. Upload images and videos, obviously. Videos and images are what catch our attention. You have to be very, very invested in somebody to stop for text. Yeah, you're going to stop for a video. And we make a decision about whether or not to watch a video in the first three seconds. So if you don't catch me in that first three seconds and don't let me know what that video is going to be in those first three seconds, I'm likely to move on. And finally, product-centric posts with engaging and interesting content. Yeah, so um, I'm a big believer in the 80-20 rule. Only 20% should be specifically about what you do and your buy now type posts. 80% should be about everything else. Now, what you can do is talk about the beautiful autumn colors and how inspirational they are and that you've, they've inspired you to buy your next restock. Yeah, and that you've got all of those pumpkin things coming. Yeah, that's not specifically about what you sell but you are still talking and you're having a conversation with your community. So a couple of examples for you. So this is um, Beezy's. This is a little gift shop that I've come across on social media. I really like the, the way that they do things. So this is um, talking about the card. We all have one of these mates. Tag them below. Yeah, so just trying to get people to tag. And they had quite a lot of interaction on it, I have to say. Um, loads of people where it was saying um, girls can just celebrate on one birthday. They have lots of opportunities to celebrate. Um, my friend was 50 last year, and she's still celebrating it now. <laughs> um, she's actually 52 in December, and she's still celebrating her 50th, partly because of COVID, so we'll give her that. Um, but she's going to be celebrating 50 for a long time. Um, so we all do have one of those mates, yeah? So think about your audience. What do they connect with? What are they likely to connect with? Ask them a question. And on this one, ask them to tag one of their friends. And then, don't buy her flowers. This is a, a, web, a, a social media page that I very often use as an example because I really like the way that they put together their content. So this is, buying for birthdays has become one of the most popular reasons for sending a box. Top nine gift boxes that our customers choose to send as birthday gifts. So again, making it really easy for people to buy, but not just simply saying, these are great, this is what you need, buy it now. Yeah, giving people options, letting them feel that they have the choices, and making it really easy for them to make that decision. A couple of examples from Instagram. So again, this is Beezus again on the left-hand side. So this is just a little opening up of the shop. She does this probably once a week, showing any new stock, any new bits that have come in. Um, you know, the sto stores open, come in and say hi. These are all the things that we've got available. Um, and it's a reel, so it helps with that algorithm in terms of the video. Daisy Days Homeware, who are, as far as I'm aware, I think they're completely online. I have purchased from them, but I'm fairly certain they are completely online. They, they don't have a bricks and mortar. But always kind of creating that look and that feel, so very seasonal. So has been talking about pumpkins and fall and autumn and all those kinds of things for a little while. Um, shoppable posts, again, makes it really easy for me. But lots of kind of like how you can create this look yourself. Yeah, so it's not just a case of, I've got these cute pumpkins, come and buy them. But this is how you can dress them. This is how you can use them. Um, and, you know, creating lots of different opportunities for you to be able to create that same look in your home. And then Pinterest. So this is an ideas one on the left-hand side. So last chance, only a few left of our wildly popular. And this is their um, rainbow multicolored rug. So this is like a collection of artists who um, all work together. And then on the right, 10 small bedroom design ideas. All of these items are for sale through an affiliate for this particular one. This one isn't even selling the items themselves. It's a, an affiliate. As you can see, 2 million followers. Um, but little bedrooms don't have to feel that way. Try these small bedroom decorating ideas to give yours a bigger, brighter version. Um, and lots of different ways of, again, of being able to buy and being able to click through and buy. But also adding value. So not just saying, buy this. It's the sort of thing that people are looking for. They're looking for ideas about small bedroom spaces. So a little bit of homework for you again. 
What content does your audience need to see from you? What will help them to engage and connect with you and your community? So when you're thinking about that building of that community and you're thinking about the content that you're going to create to start conversation and to have those conversations, yeah, what do they want to see from you? What's going to get them to do that? You're not going to always get it right. Sometimes you'll ask a question, you'll put something out there and you'll see crickets. Yeah, there'll be nothing in there, nothing at all. And there's nothing more downheartening. But keep at it. We know it's about regularity and consistency and it's about seeing the right content from you at the right time. And sometimes that needs experimentation. You need to work on that. It's not going to happen overnight. One of the questions I get asked probably more than anything else is, how can we make something go viral? You can't, unfortunately. There isn't a formula. If there was, with the greatest of respect, I wouldn't be here. I'd be in, on an island somewhere, my own private little island, <laughs> enjoying the sunshine because I would have made my millions. There isn't a formula for it. Viral is actually normally happens by happenstance rather than anything else. So a couple of top tips for you. One is be responsive. Always respond to comments when you can. It amazes me how many times I go on both big and small brands when I'm on um, social media. You ask a question, you don't get a response. I've had it done to me. I ask a question about a price or availability or if I can have something, you know, I've, I've got a question about something, nobody comes back to me. Does that inspire me to buy from them or to go back to them? No, it doesn't. Be consistent. Yeah, so the kind of content that you create that fits your personality, that fits who you are as a business... Keep doing that. Keep putting it out there and keep going with it. It does require consistency. And I don't mean kind of like Monday, Wednesday, Friday at 9 a.m. But if you post two or three times a week, stick to two or three times a week. Keep that consistent for the algorithms, but also for your customers. And always think quality over quantity. So you're, best, you're much better to have three or four really good quality posts than you are to have five or six a day that mean nothing. Yeah, so quality over quantity. And inject your personality into your content. If you're a smaller business, this is your superpower. This is who, what makes you different than anybody else, is people can connect with you. They can have that connection with you. Some of the brands that I follow where they are women in business, I feel like I know them. Yeah, I connect with them and I message them. and I, I've never met them in real life, but I feel like I know them. Yeah, because I see their content and they've shared something a little bit about themselves that matches with me. So inject your personality into your content. Remember that you are your biggest superpower in business. And then create your own community around that. So your vibe attracts your tribe. You need to be genuine. You need to be you. But it will happen. It needs consistency, absolutely. And it takes hard work. This is not a quick fix by any stretch of the imagination. It takes consistency and hard work, absolutely. But it will be worth it and post regular content. So if you, you know, don't do one thing and then never do it again just because, oh, it didn't work very well. Tweak it, make it a little bit different if you need to, but keep doing it and keep at it. And use your analytics, yeah? So use those insights. It's not just a case of, well, I think it was my best one ever, but I know this was my best one ever. Set yourself that target and keep working towards it. Find your best ever engagement rate. That's what you're always looking to beat. So that's it in terms of the slides. Just to let you know, we do have a Facebook group if you want to join us. It's a free group, obviously, online. It's our online retail group. Um, we, I appear in there every now and then um, talking about different things. We've got a couple of things talking about Christmas coming up in the next couple of weeks as well. So feel free to join us. Um, and, you know, you just have to answer a couple of quick questions and then you're in. Um, and we're more than happy to answer questions in there as well. So if you do have any questions or anything you want to know, please do join us there. We've also got lots of free resources on our website, so you can sign up for our newsletter. We don't bombard you, we don't sell you information, obviously, but we do provide you with really useful online marketing hints and tips. We've got webinars, free webinars. We've got a blog as well, so we always keep that topical. Um, if we do a monthly roundup, so if things have changed, we'll let you know what those changes are and how they may, might affect you as well. So I have got a few minutes for questions. If anybody does have a question, feel free to raise a hand. Email me if you don't want to do it um, now. If you're a little bit shy, um, then email amy at socialbeer.co.uk or hang around and chat. As I said, I am on a bit of a run to the other side shortly. Um, so I need to be leaving in five, ten minutes just to be able to get over the other side and get mic'd up for this exact same presentation. <laughs> um, but if you do have any questions, then Molly and Evie will we'll be hanging around and they'll be more than happy to help. So thank you very much for joining us. Thank you very much for giving your time. I hope you found it helpful and I hope that it helps you to build your own community on social media. ask me. Yes. I'm really sorry, I can't hear you. Have we got a mic? Sorry. 
Oh, I've just realised. Hello. Uh, hello, I haven't seen you in a while. <laughs> um, what do you feel about music on uh, social posts? Um, original audio is better. We know that they favour original audio. So if you can, and I'm not necessarily saying write a song, but original audio with your voice or something like that, actually, we know that they reward that. They like original audio. Um, in terms of music, just make sure that it's appropriate more than anything else. And there are some times where you maybe don't want, if you're doing a reveal or you're showing a reveal or something like that, you want something in the background, just make sure that you pick something from within the platforms and it's something that's not going to get you in trouble for copyright. Yeah, because that's what you don't—you don't want, definitely don't want to get in trouble for copyright. Um, sometimes, as well, what you might find is that, uh, particularly on Instagram, you have restricted access. So, to music, that can depend on what you're set up as in terms of what kind of business you are. So, some—if you're a creator, you get access to a lot more music. Um, some people have had a problem where music's been really restricted for them, and it's because of the profile setup that they've got in terms of the type of business that they are. Um, that seems to have eased a little bit. They have made a few changes with that. Um, but yeah, we know that Instagram in particular rewards original audio. So if it can be your voice, you speaking or something like that, then it will, it will help. Any other questions? No, well, if you do have any questions, as I said, please, do, um, please don't hesitate to email me, amy at socialb.co.uk. If you want a copy of the slides, please feel free to give your cards to Molly and Evie. We'll make sure that we get those sent out to you in the next couple of days. And obviously, then, if you do have any questions, you'll have our information just to give us a shout. And we'd be more than happy to help if we can. Thank you.